Amen. I like that, don't you? I'll meet you in the morning. When we get to heaven, it'll be morning all the time. There won't be a sunlight like we got now. The S-O-N will be the light of all of heaven. I'm looking forward to that, aren't you? Well, I appreciate you being here tonight. I tell you what, folks, and how cold it's going to be. It's supposed to be the coldest night we've had yet tonight, down below 20 in some places. And so uh, I hope that you'll stay warm. If you don't have a warm house to stay in, if your house is cold and dreary and damp, Brother Tommy said he and Nancy will open up their house to you. And Tommy will cook for you. And Nancy will clean for you and all that kind of stuff. And uh, no, if you... Uh, but we do have a guest house back here you can stay in. Or you come stay with us or uh, stay with uh, Betty. No, I can't stay with Betty and them because she's, she's got germs. She's carrying germs. <laughs> she's a germ carrier today. She says, I can't shake hands. I've been, I've been this and that. And I said, okay, just back off, back off. All right. Well, let's pray, and then we'll have our first couple of songs. All right. Lord Jesus, thank you again for another day time that we could be in church this morning and Lord what a good service that was we pray now dear God that you'll once again meet with us and and that we'll not just take Lord this service for granted as if it was just another service but God that we'll learn something tonight we'll grow we'll mature and Lord uh, we'll hear something Lord that uh, you have just for us sometimes it's just a statement that might ring Lord our hearts bell so bless the service now all that goes on may you get honor and glory in it Thy name we pray and ask it. Amen and amen. All right, what page number? Page number, one. number one. All I stand and sing. Number one. Amen. All right, first, second, third, and last. I stand amazed in the grass of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he can love me. A sinner can do.
page number 20, we'll sing all three stanzas. I'm standing on the solid yes, rock. Amen. 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 Through my disappointment, strife and discontentment, I cast my every care on the Lord. No matter what obsession, pain or deep depression, I'm standing on the solid rock. I'm standing on the rock of the ages, from all the storms that rage. your breath. Huh? Yes, sir. Boy, Miss Betty plays that song the way it's supposed to be done. If you had Miss Baker on that song, we'd be really gasping. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sherry's mother back years and years ago when Miss Baker played the piano, uh, she just played it fast. No matter, you know, no matter what it was, it was, it was a little faster than normal. And every time we get to the house, the church mother would say, Whew, boy, I'm out just from singing at your church. <laughs> Amen. That's a great song, isn't it? All right. Well, let's go ahead and get these announcements out of the way, and then we'll have the choir to sing for us again tonight, okay? Uh, well, let's see here. Uh, we've got revival services coming up over in March the 6th to the 9th. Uh, Brother Doug Benton will be here. I'm looking forward to that. Camp meeting over in April will be here. And uh, uh, once again, I want to remind you to pray for uh, Sister Allison's son with cancer. He's going to go this week for some more tests to, uh, about the magnitude of it. I talked to Brother Philip Willis today. He heard about his situation. He's going also this Tuesday to try to get a more detailed uh, report on exactly what's wrong with him. And we, we're praying that both of these will get good reports, okay? And then I mentioned this morning about uh, Brother B.B. Uh, B. Boyle. He was up in Connecticut with his sons up there being ordained. And while he was there, he had a heart attack and passed away and went to heaven. And then I found out today, Brother Terry Bird, one of our faithful men who comes to the camp meeting every year, hardly ever misses. Uh, he was up in North Carolina in a meeting up there, and uh, he had a heart attack. Now he's doing. He had to have uh, Duke had to go to Duke University, and they were able to help him. He's home resting well and doing better. And uh, I haven't talked to him. I'll probably talk to him tonight or in the morning. And uh, so I've come to the conclusion: between the age of sixty and eighty, uh, you don't know from day to day what's going to be like. Okay, you can be in good health today, and tomorrow uh, you could be in poor health. Okay, so. Uh, We'll continue to pray for these people in the days ahead. All right. Uh, if you didn't, I don't think there's any left back there. I mentioned this morning about, uh, you know, politics is if, if you getting, how many of you getting phone calls? Folks want to know about how you're going to vote. I'm telling you what's the truth. So they drive me nuts. I said, I said, I'm voting for Lincoln. <laughs> then, uh, I, <laughs> yeah, vote for Lincoln back there. There you go. And, uh, well, be honest with you, Lincoln could probably do a good job of what we got right now. And uh, 
uh, you know, just flip a coin. All right, let's do this. But, uh, but it, we, are, we are in a situation, and uh, I've never told you how to vote. I might try to steer you a certain way because of, of Christian convictions. And, uh, but I do know that there are some candidates who, who are professing Christians. I won't doubt that. And, uh, but even at that, you know, sometimes you have to uh, listen carefully. And, hey, if you listen, that's what I found out. If you've got any questions about a, a, a fellow running for office, call the headquarters and just ask them, you know, where does he stand on this issue? And because uh, I'm telling you, the news media is biased. They really are. And they're going to tell you exactly what they want, they want you to hear from them. And the news media is super duper way out there liberal. And they'll say anything, do anything. You see, the news media is, has a lot to do with the last two elections we had. And they are pro-liberal. The news media is wicked as the devil themselves. So anyway, you need to, understand, you need to ask questions. And, and I understand sometimes as a citizen, we... Two people may be running for office and you look at both of them and say, wow, is there anybody else? So sometimes you have to vote for the lesser of two bads. And uh, that's why it's so important to vote, okay? I do know this. I heard this, that last election, there was something like, uh, uh, I forget, over a million professing Christians didn't even vote. Didn't even vote at all. And uh, so anyway, uh, you need to be uh, stay up to date about these things in the day in which we live. All right, well, that out of the way, the choir's gonna sing, listen very carefully. I pray it'll bless your heart.
life is worth the living. You agree with that? Because he lives. Ah, yeah, because he lives, you can live. All fear. Oh, yeah. or two ago I was uh, just I saw Miss Baker's Facebook uh, a missionary that I know had put some stuff on there and uh, even though he was in the states uh, one of the churches that he helped get established over the Philippines that great that typhoon came through there and just wiped all kind of towns and cities and villages out this one particular village it was a church and uh, one of the churches they had helped get started they They'd come on to church, and though the pews were there, uh, they were sitting in church, and water was up between the, their calves, but right, up, right below the, their knees. They were sitting in church. I mean, and the place was full. I said, if, here in America, if we even talk about it, going to rain, folks won't come to church. If it gets cold, folks won't come to church. It's a heated building. And there in, the, there in that country, those folks saying, we're going to go to church if we have to sit in, 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 in polluted water. That, that, what does that do to you? When I, when, I, when I saw that, I thought, boy, that just humbles me. I don't even know if I'd do that. I would hope I would. I'm not saying I would, but there they sat. Just all of them sat and they just was men and women, children all sitting. You could see the water up to their, right above their calf. And uh, now the kids might have liked it. You know, I could splash around a little bit. And over here at Brandy, she's got two fight and sleep. Just lay them down, let them go to sleep is all I can say. And I put them in the floor. And uh, watch them look at me. All right. Well, we have a visiting couple here tonight. Uh, this is the Davison family, and uh, they are headed, this is Craig and Veronica, headed to Indonesia. Isn't that amazing? Robert said, where's that at? It's on the other side of the world. You, uh, you can get there from here with, a, with about a 23-hour plane flight. And anybody want to go? I don't know. I told Miss Lyons a while ago that she needs to fly with, they need a chaperone. She needs to go with them. She said, not me, <laughs> not me. And uh, it sure is good having them here, isn't it? Uh, I told them, I said, this year we're I'm pretty well booked up with missionaries, one or two f throughout the year. And uh, now next year we'll have our, our mission 
uh, Jubilee and Conference in, in the summer, but this year we're having missionaries throughout the year. And I'm looking forward to that, okay? And so he's gonna come, Craig's gonna come now and take uh, some time just to share with you uh, what God's doing in their life about their work in Indonesia and, and stuff like that. So you listen very carefully and, and, uh, and let him share his heart to you. Craig, it's good having you here. Veronica, it's good having you here. And uh, appreciate you being here, my friend. Thank Just you. make yourself an owner. It's our share privilege. With us. Amen. It was our privilege. I'll only take about 10 minutes or so here. Uh, as the pastor asks, I've got a little timer, so I don't go over. I'm known to go over. Amen. So I try to mind the man of God. I really want to. I want to try hard to do what the man of God says. So I put me a little timer here so I don't go too long. Amen. That's good. Well, my name is Craig Davidson. My wife here is Veronica Davidson. And we are uh, sent out of Trinity Baptist Church in Williamston, South Carolina. We're assisted by Macedonia World Baptist Missions and we're church planning missionaries called to the people of Indonesia. And church, uh, that's exactly what it's about. Amen. It's about people. We're not going there to change their government or their infrastructure, their educational system or their cultural ways or anything else. We're going there to change their eternity with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That is the only reason God would call us from here to there is to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified to those people and change their eternity it is about people with God yes. always has been always will be for God so loved the world not the things of the world but the people of the world yes. God's not willing that any should perish but that all come to repentance and church all means all and that's all that all means it means all yes. it doesn't matter what their hair looks like what their skin color is how their eyes are shaped what part of the world they live in none of that stuff matters to God he wants every man woman and child to come to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ repent of their sins and be saved it's about people with God again always has been and all always will be it's about people yeah. and indonesia has people amen it's the fourth most populated country in the world 250 million people 230 million of those are muslim it's the largest muslim nation in the world today and one of the least evangelized places why would you say that well they tell me that there's only about 100 independent fundamental bible believing bible preaching churches in the entire country just a hundred so that means we've got one church for every two and a half million people Why'd you quit talking? Because I really want that to sink in. Oh, my. One church for every two and a half million people. Now, I'm like y'all, I shake my head at that. I just don't understand that. I don't really get a hold of it. But I want to give it to you another way to give you a better idea of how few churches that is in a country that size. Indonesia as a country is made up of 17,508 different islands. Wow. All those islands collectively make up the country of Indonesia. However, only 6,000 of those islands have people. So if we've got 6,000 islands with people, but only 100 churches preaching the truth, then potentially we've got 5,900 islands with no church and no gospel presence. That's 5,900 islands out of 6,000 with no church and no gospel presence. It's unchurched, unreached, and unevangelized. Now I realize we live in a day and age where we're internet savvy and all that, especially some of y'all younger people. And uh, you probably got phones and pocketbooks and phones in your car and phones in your pockets that you can Google churches in Indonesia. I realize you can do that, and I, and I hope that you do. But surely somebody in here is going to go home, Google churches in Indonesia. You're going to come back and tell your pastor, do not even consider supporting that missionary because he's a liar. He'll, you'll say, look, look at all the churches in Indonesia. There's churches on every island. Well, there are all types, all kinds, all flavors, all styles. Uh, you, they, if you search long enough, you'll find some things you never even heard of in Indonesia <laughs> where they take some of this and some of that and some of that and some of that, roll it up in a ball, call it a religion, worship it and die and go to hell doing so. Mm. But what I want to admonish you about tonight is if you go searching churches and you find a so-called Christian church, oh my goodness, do I admonish you tonight from the pulpit of God to dig around in their doctrine because yeah. more than likely you're going to find out that they have a form of godliness but they deny the power thereof. Yeah. The apostle Paul said it's the power of God that leads a man or woman unto salvation. There is no other way than through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and that is it. The only way to God the Father is through the Son. That's it. There's no other way. You cannot go around the power, amen? That's right. So you're going to find some churches there, especially the ones that are Christian, please dig around in their doctrine. I'll give you an example of one of those churches on the island of Sulawesi. It's a larger island there. 
And if you'll uh, find this church there, it's a, it's a little white church. It's got a, a little white building there with a white cross above two wooden doors. There's a man there that walks around with a black suit and a white collar. Uh, I mean, they got Bibles under their arms, crosses around their necks. I mean, they look like Christians, sound like Christians, act like Christians. Everything about them says Christianity till you dig around in their doctrine. Yeah. And then you find out they got a form of godliness. Why? Well, that same church that says they're Christian, when they've got a little boy or a little girl in their tribe or city there die, they carry the lifeless body, that little boy or girl, out into the rainforest. They hollow out uh, one of those great big giant rainforest trees. They hollow out the trunk of that tree. And then they stuff the dead body, that little boy or girl, into the trunk of that tree, put a little door over the hole. And they believe right now today in their minds and hearts that the spirit of that child then goes up the trunk of that tree and out the limbs and leaves into some spirit worm. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not my Bible. No, no. Well, and they said they're Christian. They're not. They're not a true Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, God-fearing, Christ-honoring church. They're just not there. There's only about 100 true, independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches in the whole country. Just 100. That's it. One church for every two and a half million people. It's unreached, unchurched, and unevangelized. Not only that. When we look at the fact of how few churches are there and how many islands are there and how many people are there. But church, it's also a great need for the word of God to get there. There are 742 dialects of language in Indonesia. God help. 742. And only about 100 of those have the Bible or a portion of the Bible in their native tongue. So potentially we've got 650 languages in Indonesia that have no word of God. None. The Bible said man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's right. So when God, not if, but when God gives us converts, and we can't give them the word of God, not even John or Romans, nothing. We can't give them anything to take back with them to feed on. How do we expect them to grow? So we have to. I'm telling you, we could take thousands of people right now today, put us all on a plane, send us all to Indonesia, and spend the rest of our lives just translating the word of God, and we'd barely scratch the surface. That's there's so much work to be done there. It's unreached, unchurched, and unevangelized. Indonesia, when you think about all those things coupled together, is the least evangelized place in this world. There's island after island after island after island after island where they've never even heard the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it does fill me up to think about the fact that I could be, and my wife and I could be the very first one. My lips could be the ones that speak the soul-saving name of Jesus Christ to ears that have never heard. Time and time and time again. God, that... That helps me. What a privilege. Just little old me. But God gives us the privilege to be the ones that could share the gospel of Jesus Christ to people over and over again that's never even heard it. I've knocked on a million doors, it seems like, in Williamston, South Carolina. But I'm going to tell you now, everybody down there is saved. Everybody knows Jesus. Everybody's going to heaven. Gets so sick and tired of hearing all these reasons and all those things. Why? But boy, it, it just it, I long in my heart to walk up to somebody and say, have you ever heard of Jesus? And they go, no. What well, can I tell you about him? Yeah. Amen. Wouldn't that be a good day? Wow. To be the first one to speak the soul-saving name of Jesus Christ to ears that have never heard. Wow. So you say, preacher, well, what are you going to do? I mean, you've got the fourth most populated country in the world, 250 million people, largest Muslim nation in the world. You've got all these islands and so few churches. I mean, you've got to have a plan, right? Yes, I do. What's your plan? Well, one thing, to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, and that's it. Yeah. That's the only plan I know. I am not going to, and God knows my heart, I'm not being critical, but I'm not going to be one of those missionaries that stands in front of you and says, in six months I'll be here, one year there, two years I'll be doing that. Five. I don't have that kind of plan. When I go there, if I go there today, that plan's going to be the same as if ten years from now, and that plan is to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Why? Because it works. Yes. It's worked for 2,000 years. It worked in my life. It worked in your life. Why would I make a new plan? Why would I come up with something different when this works just fine? Yeah. So I want to go to Indonesia, go there, be obedient and yielded to God, and preach the Word of God. Preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I believe we can turn Indonesia upside down for Jesus if we just sow the seed of the Word of God. Not because of who we are, but because of who He is. Who he is. Yeah. God's the one that gives increase. I realize that this is up to her and I need to quit now and go home and forget it. But it's not. We just need the instruments in God's hand. God gives increase. Isn't that what Apostle Paul said in right. Corinthians chapter 3? That's he right. Said, I planted the Paul's water into what God gave the increase. Yes. God yeah. uses people. He works through Paul. He worked through Apollos just like He can work through her and I to reach the people of Indonesia. He will give the increase if we will just so to see. God will do the work. Yes, he will be obedient. Yeah. See, church, that's where y'all come in. We need you. 
right. I would love it. Church, partner so that we together can turn Indonesia upside down for Jesus Christ's sake. Our plan is to go and preach the gospel, and that's it. But we need your help. We need your prayers, and we need your financial support to put our feet on the ground so we can start sowing the seed of the Word of God. Mm. We're asking you. Yeah. Prayerfully consider. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Ten minutes and 30 seconds. Thank you. We can't support this guy. He, he don't want to go nowhere. We can't take him on. He's too fired up. He got to calm down. But he about got me fired up. Hey Amen. I might go with you. Where's Miss Baker at? I would. Got to take shots. I don't feel the call now. <laughs> the nudge is gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I never heard a shot getting grace. <laughs> Get shots. It's in there somewhere. Praise the Lord. Wasn't that good? Praise the Lord. I like that. Amen, amen, amen. And we might have to be a part of this. I tell you what, he didn't told us we got to do it. He didn't even ask us. Y'all got to be a part of it. You got to help us. You got to join with us and all that. And uh, I, I love that, don't you? That blesses my heart. All right. Well, we are going to receive an offer tonight. Every Sunday night, we take another's offering. We want to uh, be good to them, Brother and Sister Davison. And they'll be headed back tonight, headed back up. They're not going to spend a night. They won't have a day and just rest in a few moments in the guest house. But they will be headed back up to the upper part of the state tonight. We pray they'll have a safe journey. But we are going to receive an offering for them, so everything you give tonight will go toward them. And so we want to do that right now. Okay, so let's come and have a, a good song and sing a couple of verses and receive tonight's other's offering. All right, let's all stand. Turn to page number 157, 157. We'll sing the first and last of Jesus Paid It All. Amen? Yes, Amen. 157. Savior save thy strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin I left the crimson stain he washed it white Died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. All right, aren't you glad He did that? Amen, amen. I'm going to ask Brother Denny Farrell if he'll pray and ask God to bless the offering and bless this couple that's here, meet every need they have. Brother Denny, would you pray? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord.
she done, she's done it again. I tell you what, great is thy faithfulness. Oh, boy. Mm. All I've needed, thy hands have provided. Uh, somebody's preaching, do you, do you come prepared to preach when we have missionaries? I come prepared to preach every time we come to church. What was you going to preach on tonight? Well, he's going to preach, but I, I was going to preach on this thought tonight. You can do it. Well, Paul said, I can do what? All things. I was going to preach on, you can do it. Amen. Amen. Well, but Brother David is going to come and he's going to preach. We're going to let him do it. As far as the preaching, all right? It's good to have you here, preacher. Amen. I pray, I pray God will bless you as you preach. What time I want you done? About 10. We'll do it we can. Okay, amen. <laughs> I should be done by then, praise the Lord. Well, again, it's good to be here tonight, and uh, I just appreciate the presence of God, yeah. the liberty of the Spirit, amen. It's not like this everywhere we go. It's our 143rd meeting, and uh, again, it's just not like this everywhere we go. So I thank God for these times. Uh, Luke 17, if you go to Luke 17 with me, I was talking about some of the things about the physicalities of Indonesia there in that presentation. And uh, my wife and I went to Indonesia in October of 2014 on a survey trip and church, that's what it was. It was to survey Indonesia. We were not going there to confirm God's call. God did that long before October in the word of God and in prayer. We knew God called us to Indonesia. So it wasn't a confirmation trip, it was a survey trip. So we went there to survey what we were getting into. Part of me wish I never went to survey. I'd have just went once I had the, the money and just went, you know. I had the support, but uh, nonetheless, God opened that door and we went there October 2014 and, and, and we, we saw a lot of things in those 14 days and experienced a lot of things in 14. It changed our lives. We were people who thought we'd, we were very considerate of, of the things God gave us on a daily basis and we never wanted to take things for granted but we didn't realize how much we did take for granted until we got to a place like that right. Indonesia is more or less a third world country and most of it so on and so forth but I mean there is no clean water in the whole country uh, the, the food every time you eat you got a 50-50 chance of getting some kind of a foodborne illness some kind of a disease uh, you know there's a daytime mosquito that gets you a nighttime mosquito that'll get you uh, one of them gives you malaria the other one gives you what they call dengue fever and dengue fever has a nickname called breakbone disease and when they told me about that I said you got, you got to tell me what that is I, that don't even sound good breakbone disease it's where the mosquito bites you and then it feels like your joints every joint in your body is being crushed and the older you are the longer it lasts there's no pill, no vaccine you just got to let it run its course I said man and it just all these different things that we faced and we're up against, and they told us about that we never even did see, or it had to, in 14 days we didn't face. But all these different things. So I'm, I'm on a plane for 23 hours coming back home. That's a lot of time to sit in one seat and think yeah. about what you just yeah. went through and what you just saw and yeah. what God was calling you and your wife to. So I mean, it's just not me, she's going to, and she's gonna have to go through it all as well. Wow. And I'm, th I'm thinking, in 23 hours I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, God, you gotta help me here. Because I'm thinking back on all of that stuff, all the circumstances of what I saw and all the physical things that are against us. And I said, Lord, you've got to help me if you want me to go back there and do what you asked me to do and you know, preach the word and disciple those, those converts and plant independent Baptist churches and do all that. You're going to have to help me. Because, I mean, you didn't make it a bunch of roses from what I saw. Yeah. It just didn't look good. No. Didn't really feel good. That's right. She said, God, you've got to help me. And the one thing that kept coming back to mind is I kept wanting to ask God for faith. But you have to help me with faith on this. You gotta give me the faith to be able to do what you're asking me and my wife to do. And as I sat on that plane, I thought about this, what the disciples had told the Lord in Luke 17. Jesus told them about forgiveness and it was what he, what he taught them about was radical. And when they realized and they let it sink in, we dropped down to 17 and five and the Bible said this, and the apostles, which are the disciples, said unto the Lord, increase our 
faith. Jesus, what you just taught us is so radical and so backwards and so what we're not used to. And I can't, I can't see it in my own mind. I can't make it add up. Lord, you're going to have to do something. And that is increase our faith. And notice in your Bible, it's not a question mark there. At the end of the verse, it's a period. It's a statement. They weren't asking Jesus if he could, if he would, or if he was able. They simply said, Lord, here's my statement. If you want me to do what you just asked us to do, you're going to have to increase our faith. It's a statement. So as I'm sitting there on the plane for 23 hours, I said, God, you're going to have to increase our faith if you want us to do what you're calling us to do. That's what I need. Amen. I need faith. God, give it to me. I, it wasn't a question. It was a statement, just like they said here. And what, as I think about this verse, what gets me, church, is they are, the disciples have Jesus standing in front of them. <sighs> Do you get that? It's the Son of God, the second part of the Holy Trinity is there in front of them. God in the flesh right there, and they could have asked him anything but they asked for faith. They said, give us faith. Faith. Out of all the things that you could petition God for or say to him, and it's faith. Why wouldn't you say, teach me to walk on water? I mean, that's something that would be high on my list. I would love as many little ponds and lakes as we pass between Goose Creek and Walterboro, I would have loved to stop the car, jumped out of there, and just started walking across one of them ponds. Wouldn't that be great? Why didn't they ask for that? Wouldn't it be great to have, say, Jesus, give me power in my hands to be able to go into the hospitals and touch those that are on a bed of affliction and make them rise up? Wouldn't that be wonderful to enter the hospitals and just say, rise up, and rise, take up your bed? Wouldn't it be, why wouldn't we ask for that? Or to raise the dead? I mean, that's, again, that's up there on my list. They didn't ask for none of that stuff. You know why? Because all that stuff, you're not going to ever be able to do unless you got the faith first. You'll never walk on water without faith. You'll never raise the dead without faith. You'll never touch somebody and raise them up out of a bed of affliction without that faith. God, to increase our faith that we can do what you've asked us to do. And it amazes me as well that they didn't ask for knowledge. That amazes me because in the American church today, it seems like knowledge is our measuring stick for who we are as a Christian and where we are in our Christianity. There's nothing, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with knowledge in among itself. That's right. Nothing at all. It's good to know the Word of God, divide the Word of God. Bible admonishes us to do so. But let me ask you something. What good does it do you if you can memorize every verse, if you could stand up right now and quote the entire Bible from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21? What good does it do you if you can quote it all but you don't have the faith to believe it or walk in it? That's right. I mean, what good does it do you, Christian, if you're standing in the face of adversity and you say, if God be for me, who can be against me? But you don't have the faith to walk in that or believe that. What good is it to you? What good is the word of God to a believer who doesn't believe the word of God? What good is it without faith? Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. What a promise from God. But do you walk in that and live in that? What good is that verse? That promise, if you don't have the faith to live in it and walk in it and put feet to it. Yeah. What good is the, the, the promise that Jesus gave us in Hebrews 13 that he will never leave you, never forsake you. Whether you're here in Waltonboro or there in Indonesia, God's still with you. On a plane ride for 23 hours, he's with you. Some lady, I don't remember who it was, was it you that said, I'm not going to fly? Well, that's what I told God, too. I flew one time. Her and I on our honeymoon went out to, uh, this was 18 years ago, amen. We went out to uh, Yellowstone National Park for a honeymoon. I said, I will never fly again, ever. <laughs> and then I kneel, find myself kneeling at an altar in January 2014, saying, God, I'll, I'll go to Indonesia. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll do it all. Yeah. Somehow, by the grace of God, I made it that from there to here. Faith, God, increase our faith. Because we've already said in our minds and hearts we'll do some things but not all things. But yet we have the word of God and every promise in it is yours as a believer. 
I'm telling you, we should be different. Yes, we, we, should, should. we should be different kind of people yes, we when we realize that I already have the victory and nobody can take it from me. Yeah. You might kill my body, but you can't take my soul. Right. My name is written down already in the Lamb's Amen. Book of Life. So no matter what I do or where I go, I'm okay with God. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. So I should bow up in my spirit a little bit. Amen. I should bow up a little. And be bold in what I do because I believe the word of God. Yeah. And I believe the God of the word. Mm -hmm. Faith. God, increase our faith. Yeah. They didn't ask for knowledge. They didn't ask for understanding. God's already told us in his word that you can't find my ways out. You can't. If you think you've got God figured out, then God's not God anymore. You can't know the ways of God. His ways are higher than yours and higher than mine. Amen. So they didn't ask for understanding. They didn't ask for wisdom or talents or any of that stuff. They said, give us faith. No doubt you've asked God for a lot of things today. But when's the last time you said, give me faith? <clears throat> See, that rends my heart, man. Oh, I'll lay down there and I'll get on my knees or on my face and I will beg God. Sometimes even, oh, it's almost like I'm badgering him with all these requests. But what good are those requests if I don't even believe God can handle it? Or do it. That's good for you. Faith. God increase our faith. Why? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but I'll give you just a few here. One is that if we were to look back in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, we find the Old Testament prophets saying that the just shall live by faith. And then when we go to the New Testament in Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 11, he said, the just shall live by faith. Church, the just, the redeemed, the believer, the one washed, the Christian, you and I as believers, there's one way that we're supposed to live according to the word of God. You know what it is? By faith. Do you? Come on, preacher. Do you? God, increase our faith. The just shall live by faith. Do you realize the only way that you are a believer tonight was by faith? That's right. For by grace are you saved through faith. You can't be a Christian unless you put your faith and trust in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. He, I said it before. He's the only way. You became a Christian by faith. So why would you try to walk any other way? But man, we do. You got in by faith. You need to walk by faith. Because the Bible in Hebrews 12 says that we are looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's right. Amen. He's the author of it. He started it. He originated it. He yes. began it. And he's the uh, finisher, the one who's going to complete it and bring it to perfection. Right. But there's that little three-letter word in the middle, A-N-D. He started it. He'll finish it. But there's that end. He's the author and. You know what the end is? It's your journey and mine. It's your walk and my walk. From our beginning to our end, which started in faith, ends in faith, why wouldn't we then walk it by faith? The A-N-D is your life and mine, your journey and mine, following God and everything he says do. Yes, preacher. Faith. Yeah. Walk by faith. Because I realize that the Bible also says that without, in Hebrew, uh, Hebrews eleven six, 6, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's exactly right. Without faith, it is, it is impossible to please the God of heaven. That's right. Yes, sir. Without faith. I wonder why the Bible says the just shall live by faith. That's the only way you'll ever please God. And it rends my heart. It, it actually scares me to trembling to think how much of my Christian life I've wasted because all those things that I did not do by faith, I just did it because I wanted to help my preacher. I just did it because I wanted to take part in the ministry. It was the right thing to do. They weren't bad in among themselves, but is there a reward for me? Did I do it by faith or was I just doing it to do? Wow. Faith. I realized that my wife and I, I'm 42, so God gave me another 40 years. And I, and I died on the mission field at 82 years old. I realized that if I go to Indonesia for another 40 years and I don't do any of that by faith, then when I get before him, he'll say, you did not please me. Because I went to Indonesia for some other reason, some other way, some other motive. It's got to be by faith. Otherwise, it doesn't please God. Without that faith, it never pleases God. 
ever. It rends my heart. How much time, how many things that are wasted. Faith is this in a simple definition. It's our total dependence on God and a willingness. Brother, you said your message was going to be what? To do? You can do it. God help. Brother, you just don't know. You're about to find out. It's a total dependence. Our faith is a total dependence on God and a willingness to do His will. And we're okay to that point. But here's where we kind of have a little car wreck. It's our total dependence on God and willingness to do His will without, without knowing all the details. That's it. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We as believers walk by faith and not by sight. You and I cannot connect dots first. Jesus tells you to go to, God knows I tried to connect all the dots to Indonesia. When he called me to Indonesia and my wife, the first thing I wanted to do was plan it all out and figure it all out, connect every single dot, make A go to B and B to C and D to E. I wanted two plus two to equal four real bad, but it never does in God's economy ever. Never does it add up to that. I wanted to do it, lay it all out and then say, God, I'm in. But that's not faith. And that's not how it's going to work. God's will, we do God's will by faith without knowing any of those details. We cannot connect the dots. That's not faith. We walk by faith, not by sight or connecting dots. Willingness to do His will without knowing all those details. Now, here's where it gets real good, amen? Because I find the most simple, uh, honestly, the simplest definition of you and I as a believer in John chapter 2 and verse, look, this is what, this is how each believer in here should live. This is the simplest definition of who you are and what you ought to do as a Christian. And it came from the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 2 and verse 5, she said this, whatsoever he, the Lord Jesus, saith unto you as a believer, do it. You can do it. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. You know how you'll live that kind of life? Faith. You'll never live that way. You'll never live a do it kind of life. Lest first, God increase my faith. You will not respond to what God says and just do it. You won't. Notice she didn't say, you know, whatever he says to you, memorize it, quote it, debate it, seek wise counsel about it. Get it all figured out first. That's not what she didn't even say. Pray about it. No. I'm telling you now. If, if I was not a, let me, God help me here. I could strangle, let me put it that way. I could strangle the next person that comes to me and says, God spoke to me about doing this, that, and the other. And Brother Craig, I'm praying about it. What? <laughs> That's right. What? I'm so tired of hearing that. Yeah. I am. That's not what she said. She didn't say when God speaks to you, you pray about it. God already wants you to do it. That's There's it. nothing else to pray about. You know why you're praying about it? Because you don't want to do it. Because it's outside of your box. It's outside of your boat. It's outside of your comfort zone. You don't want to do it. You're stalling. You want to connect the dots before you say, okay, God. So you're going to pray about it. That's not what she said. That's not the Christian life there. She said, whatever he says unto you, guess what? Do it. There's no praying. And notice he saith. He's not asking. That's a command from God. God's commanded all of you to reach the people of Indonesia for Jesus and everywhere else in the world. That's right. It's your responsibility. Yeah. I know you're not called there. How do you reach them? Because you're not called. Well, you send us. <laughs> Amen. Let me put that plug in there. Amen. Send us so you can fulfill your commission for the people of Indonesia. That's right. Whatever he says unto you, do it. How do you do that? By faith. He doesn't ask you. Never did Jesus come to me and my wife and gather us up and say, look, Craig, Veronica, if you've got time, and if you can fit it in your schedule, and you don't mind selling your house, and you don't mind quitting your job, and you don't mind uh, you know, going to a place like Indonesia, I would really appreciate it if you guys would just consider going to Indonesia and being church planners, if you want to. That is not how it worked. No, it's not. He commanded me and her and put that burden and that call in our hearts and said, there it is, go. Whatsoever he saith unto you, saith, not asketh, but saith, you do it. Do it. 
I find that to be who we are and what we are as believers. And even Solomon and all of his glory and Solomon had everything. I mean, he had it all. He did it all. He experienced it all. Even he said in, in chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes, he said, here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments. In other words, fear God and do what he says. Because that's the right. whole duty of man. That's, right. that's our whole duty. That's our purpose as believers. If you're here tonight, God's not done with you. If God was done with you, you wouldn't be here. God, I don't care if you're 6, 16, 60, 6, 000, It doesn't matter how old you are. If you're here, God still has something for you to do, and he's talking to you. I guarantee you he's talking to you. Now, you may not be hearing him because you're looking for some big thing, the wind, the fire, the earthquake, some kind of a big sign. But more than likely, he's speaking to you in a still small voice. And that's very easy to ignore and push away because you don't want part of it. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. One way to live that way, God increase our faith. It's amazing when I look through the Bible and some of the things that he asked his disciples to do. I mean, for example, he, he, told, he told the disciples in Mark chapter 4, just get in the boat and go to the other side. That's all the directions he had. I got to talk to Jesus about that. I'm get, get in the boat and go to the other side. That's it. Well, Lord, I mean, where is the other side exactly? And how long am I going to be there? And I mean, am I going there to plant churches and preach or am I going there to dig a well, start an orphanage? Or could you give me some help here? Give me some details so I can start connecting my dots. I mean, how long am I going to be there? Do I need to quit my job over here before I go to that side? Tell my family buyers is this just a week long? I mean, I need some details. Who, gets, who just jumps in the boat and says, okay, I'm in? The person that walks and lives by faith. I see it. And that's all. The rest of us stand on the shoreline and go, I ain't getting in there. Because you can't see it. But seeing it's not faith. Faith is just getting in the boat and going. He also told two disciples, this one really gets me in Luke 19. He comes up to two disciples. He says, guys, I want you to go into the next town. Of course, I'm paraphrasing, amen. I'm going to go into the next town. And I want you to enter into that town. And when you do, you're going to find a colt tied that's never been broken, never been trained. I want you to loose that colt. And I want you to walk that colt back to me. And by the way, when the owners of that colt say anything to you, just tell them the Lord has need of them. Go on. I got to talk to Jesus here. I mean, really, put yourself in their shoes. Okay, Jesus, hang on a minute. That's a big town over there. So exactly where is it you want me to enter in? I mean, is there a crossroad, a certain tree, some kind of path you can put me on? I mean, it's a big town. And then when I enter in, as if though I might enter in at that right place just by chance, but if I enter in there... Uh, uh, I'm going to find a certain colt tide. In that day and time, there could have been hundreds of colts there. So how am I going to know it's the right one? I mean, is it a special piece of rope? Does it have a certain marking on it? Is there something about this colt that's special so I know it's the right one? And by the way, Jesus, that thing's never been trained. It's not broken. So I'm just supposed to loose this colt and walk that colt all the way back. And it's just going to calmly and gently walk with me all the way back to you. And oh yeah, don't forget the fact that while I'm walking that untrained colt to you, uh, that the owners of it are chasing me down with pitchforks, rakes, and shovels trying to kill me because I took the colt. And all I'm supposed to say is, don't worry about it, the Lord has need of them. And all that's going to work out, right? Jesus would say, yeah. What would we say? Those two disciples said, at thy word, there they went. They walked into the next town. They entered in. They found the colt. They loosed the colt. The owner said, what are you doing? They said, don't worry. The Lord has need of them. They walked that colt all the way back to Jesus, and he rode that colt in Jerusalem. You know how that worked out? Faith. But how many of us would stand there and try to connect the dots before we'd ever move? Because we walk by sight. I'm asking God to increase our faith because I realize that when he took 11 and turned the world upside down, there's enough people in here tonight that we, if we would live a do-it kind of life and have it live by faith, we could turn this world upside down for Jesus. You would serve a God that you don't even know. You would see a side of him that you'll never know until you start walking by That's faith. Right. My wife and I, if we were still sitting in that center row at Trinity Baptist Church in Williams, South Carolina, four rows back right in the middle, we would not know the God uh, now that we know now if we were still there. We wouldn't know him. We know a different God now. 
Because when you step out and you continue to walk by faith and live by faith and trust God with all your heart, quit leaning to your own understanding, you start seeing this different side of God. That's right. You start knowing a different God than you know now. We limit an unlimited God. You and I do it. He's unlimited, no boundaries, but we box him in with our faithlessness. Oh, God, increase our faith that we can live a do-it kind of life and turn this world upside down for Jesus. My goodness, when you look through your Bible and see example after example of what he told his followers to do, and I scratch my head at a lot. I mean, when he told Ezekiel to preach to dry bones? A pile of dry bones? Who's going to do that? I do not think that those bones will live. If we all took a trip down to the local morgue and we stood around and saw all the dead bodies, who believes that they, if someone would preach to them, they'll raise up nobody? Why? We've got a faith problem. Ezekiel prophesied as he was commanded. Those bones started moving, started getting the flesh on them, the sinew and all that. Needed a little bit of breath. God said, preach to the wind. How do you do that? I can't even see wind. Preach to what? But he prophesied as he was commanded. Breath came into him. It's amazing what you look at in the Bible. And we just read over, but don't realize that they were men like you and I, flesh, bone, and blood, went through the same emotions and everything. That's right. But what they did, they That's turned right. the world upside down because they were willing to do what God said and do it by faith. That's right. mm. God help us today to live by faith. We were in uh, Florida in March or April, and I met a pastor down there who was uh, a missionary to a non-English speaking country first before he was a pastor in Florida. He, we went down and presented our ministry, we went out to Ryan's and he told me his story and I about tore Ryan's all up and got so excited. He said, Brother Craig, I went down there and I was discouraged. I went down there to church, to plant churches. And I was trying and trying and trying Nothing was happening. He said, but one day God spoke to me almost in an audible voice. He said, I absolutely knew it was the will of God. God said to go down, just down the street a ways was an outdoor, an empty outdoor basketball court that nobody hardly ever used. God said, go down there and hold a meeting. He said, I knew that that was the will of God. That's what God wanted me to do. He said, I knew it without a doubt. So he said, I spent the next three months, him, his wife, and his two small children spent the next three months pouring money into it, uh, printing uh, literature and brochures. They went around and stuffed them in mailboxes and knocked on doors and told people. I mean, they worked and worked and worked, prayed and fasted for three months. They did all this, getting ready for this one day so that they could preach in this outdoor basketball court and win people to Jesus and start their church. That was the plan. So imagine pouring yourself every minute of every day into prayer and fasting and, and making it known that this meeting is going to be in this outdoor basketball court. And that day comes, man, they are excited. He said, we got down there early. And he said, I brought my SUV down there. And he said, we had tables and we brought the tables out and set them up and put drinks and food on it, man, expecting a crowd. And they had Bibles laid up and discipleship material and all kinds of literature. And I mean, they were ready. Paul even made himself a little makeshift wooden pulpit and had it sitting there ready to preach his message out on this outdoor basketball court because God said he's going to do what God told him to do. And the time came to start the meeting. You know how many were there? Nobody. Not one person showed up out of three months of hard labor, prayer, and fasting. He said, brother, the only way I can describe it is letting an air out of a balloon. He said, I'm just deflated. He said, I could not believe that not even one person showed up. So he told his family, he said, let's wait 30 more minutes. And they did. Nobody showed up. He said, let's wait 30 more. They did, and nobody showed up. He said, at this point, I'm just mad. I, I can understand that. I mean, if we'll be honest, I'd be mad too. He said, about that time, it's starting to get dark, and on the left-hand side of that outdoor basketball court, about midway down, was a pole with a light on it. It was starting to come on. It was just lighting up, kind of dimly lighting that basketball court up. He said, I waited 30 more minutes, and nobody showed up. He said, I was so mad. I said, we're going to pack this up, and we're getting out of here. So literally, they were, the family was trying to you know, box things back up. He said, I was grabbing stuff and just chunking it in the back of the SUV. He said, I was so mad. I'm just throwing it in there. Tables, literature, the whole nine yards. I can understand how he feels. And he's mad at God, mad at the whole situation. He said, I'm throwing everything in there. He said, I grabbed my pulpit. And he said, about time I picked that up and went to throw it in the back of the, the truck, the SUV. He said, somebody said, preach. He said, I didn't know where that came from. He said, I heard it again, preach. Preach. It just kept coming. 
and he was trying to ignore it. He said, the time I picked my Bible up, he said, I went and slung that thing in the car and I was grabbing some other things to throw in there. He said, I kept hearing it and it was coming faster and louder. Preach, preach, preach. Everything I was picking up, preach, preach, preach. Finally, it was so loud and so often, he stopped. He said, I looked at the sky and said, preach to what? He knew it was God speaking to him. All he could see is an empty basketball court. God, what do you want to preach to? His wife is now standing over there crying, wondering what's wrong with him. The kids were thinking, God, what's wrong with dad? They're scared. He's over here yelling at the sky. What do you want to preach to? Ain't nobody here. I mean, I can feel, I understand what he's yeah, going through. Preacher. But preach, 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 preach. That's all he heard. He said, finally, I got so irritated and mad. He said, I grabbed the foot of that pulpit in the, car, in the truck. He said, I dragged that thing back out and I slammed it down on the ground. He said, I was like a three-year-old having temper tantrum. And I can understand that too. He said, give me my Bible. And his wife, she said, she was, here, take your Bible. He's like, thank you. And he put it down on the pulpit. And he said, I slung that thing open and took it to my text. And he said, I stood there in an empty basketball court and preached my entire message to an empty basketball court. And his family thinks he's lost his mind. He said, I got done preaching that message. He said, I grabbed that Bible. Slam that thing shut. He said, I slung it in the car. Picked that pulpit up, slung it in the car. I said, there, are you happy now? I said, brother, it's a wonder God didn't shoot you down with a bolt of lightning or something. <laughs> he said, but you weren't there. You don't know. I said, brother, I, I do. I feel your pain. I'd be the same way. Are you happy now? And they grabbed the last few things, and they were getting ready to close that truck up, and they heard a noise behind them. See, there was on the, on the right-hand side of that basketball court was a real thick tree line. And about the time they were about ready to close that thing up, they heard a noise. So they turned around to see, and here comes this old woman about half bent over. They said she comes walking out of there, out of the darkness there into that dim light. Boy, that'll preach. Come out of that darkness into that little dim light there. Right. Amen. And so he turned around and said, can I help you? She said, well, I was sitting over there on my balcony, and I heard what you said, and I want to know this Jesus you've been talking about. So he got to lead that old woman to Jesus Christ, Amen. his very first convert. What's the big deal? The big deal is that he only saw an empty basketball court. He couldn't see what, what the God of heaven could see. And that was an old woman sitting on her balcony. And I believe that was appointed and anointed from the dawn of time that Paul would stand there in that empty basketball court and preach that message so that she could be on her balcony on that same appointed day and hear that message. It was not about filling up the basketball court. It wasn't about putting out all the literature. See, Paul connected a lot of dots he didn't need to connect. He should have just showed up and preached it right there in that basketball court because there was only one woman needed to hear. Yeah. Oh, church! How do you preach to an empty basketball court? By faith, you do what God says because you can't see what God can see. The next time God asks you, no, tells you to do something that doesn't make sense, that doesn't add up, that two plus two doesn't equal four, and A doesn't come to B, you just do what He says when it doesn't make sense because God sees something you can't. Faith, faith, largest Muslim nation in the world. That doesn't make sense. Faith. Why would somebody go to North Korea and preach the gospel? Faith. And it doesn't even have to be far and field. What about when he tells you to walk across the street and knock on a door? Yeah. What about when he tells you to witness to someone you do not like? Faith. Enemy. An enemy of yours. God, the Bible still says you got to love them. Yeah. Got to give the gospel to them. That doesn't make sense to us. You know how you do that? Faith. Who's going to preach the dry bones? Ezekiel did. Would you? Would you preach to an empty basketball court? Would you do the things that God asked you to do when it does? Will you get in that boat? Will you go in a lion's den? Will you get in a fiery furnace? I'm telling you. It doesn't make sense and you can't see it and you can't add it up, but I'll tell you, if you'll just do what he says, something will come out of it you never expected. God will take that what seems to be a little thing and turn it into something greater than you ever expected or thought of in your mind. We can turn this world upside down for Jesus just by living a do-it kind of life. Just do it. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. How? How? Well, God increase our faith. 
That's my prayer tonight. Father in heaven, God, I always say this. I always feel like a failure. I always feel like I never deliver it the way it's supposed to be delivered. God, I'm just I'm a mortal man made of flesh. You understand my ways, but I don't understand yours. All I can say, God, is I've sown the seed, and now I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit will begin working in our hearts. I am so desirous tonight, Lord, that everybody in here would just get a hold of the fact yes, that you can use them yes. way beyond their imagination yes. or ability. Yes. Not looking for ability, just availability. Will somebody make themselves available to God, come to an old-fashioned altar tonight, and say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. Is there something God's dealing with you about that you can't figure out in your mind? Well, today's the day just to surrender to it. Just to do it. Oh, God, God of glory, in the name of Jesus Christ and His shed blood, I pay, pray that the power of God fall upon us tonight. Yes. Lord, that we surrender our lives forever from this point forward. God, that you would anoint some missionaries tonight. You'd anoint some preacher boys. You'd anoint some pastors, some pastors' wives. You would anoint these people to be able to win people to Jesus. God, anoint our mouths, our minds, our lips. God, our eyes. God, may the scales of, uh, uh, just fall from our eyes that we might see spiritually for once in our Christian life. God, that we'd make the decision tonight to live by faith and only by faith, but to bow up. Oh God, that we may bow up in our spirit tonight, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. God, that we believe your word and you and everything about it, Lord, that we would just realize that you're the God that you say you are. You're the God that can part seas and you're the God that can take heat out of fire. You're the God that can make the sun stand still and make iron float. You're the God that can walk on on water and raise the dead and you're the one that we get to follow God there's nothing that we cannot do with you for you said that there's nothing impossible with God and when we're following you and when, when, you're, when we're in your hand God there's nothing that we cannot do so Lord burden us beyond measure tonight burden us God that we would just get a hold of who you are and who we are in you and turn this world upside down for Jesus while there's still time God help us set us free from our bondage Set us free from our limitations. Set us free tonight, Lord, that we may serve you with a fervency, with a fire shut up in our bones. Oh, God, make a difference in our lives tonight. And I ask it by the power in the name of Jesus. God, let it be done. Let it be done and let us be obedient. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. Pastor. Stand to our feet. Do what he tells you to do. Not what the preacher tells you to do, but what God tells you to do. If you're not careful, you'll be led astray by man who, who have good intentions. If you're not careful, you'll mind your parents and, instead of God. You need to mind your parents, but God's word's more important. Increase, increase my faith, Lord. Just do it, and you can do it. Paul said, I can do all things. How, Paul? Through Christ. Through Christ. Can't do it through yourself, your own strength and energy, but you can through Christ. And you can do what he tells you to do. The preacher said you can't live by figuring it out, planning it out. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. And that's for all ages too. Teenage boys and girls, children. Just do it. Increase, increase our faith. I'll be honest with you, you never know what God may tell you to do. I mean, just for you. Just for you.
I've heard preachers say, do what I say, do what I say. Mind the preacher. And there's a small truth in that. But I'm going to tell you something. The greatest truth is doing what he says. That's the most important thing. He's told you to witness somebody you ever thought about witnessing to calling somebody con contacting somebody and just do it just do it he may be preparing them for your call your visit just do it amen amen thank you preacher I'm going to tell you what we needed that tonight far exceeded what I was going to preach amen in my opinion and uh, so I'm glad I minded the Lord tonight amen we, did you think we needed this? Amen. And so I, there's no doubt in my mind we, we got to take this fellow on. If we don't take him on, we, 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 we just won't be in the will of God. Amen. How you feel about that? All right. I think, well, I'm just sitting over this. Lord, tell me what to do now. Tell me what to do. And uh, so he's laid upon my heart that we would buy our plane tickets when they get ready to go. It's all based on how much it costs, though. <laughs> I'm just teasing. No. What do plane tickets cost? Three to four thousand dollars for both of you. Just let us know. Okay. What do you think about that? <laughs> how can a church this size do that? Well, that's because we got a God bigger than us. We got a God that's not limited to a building. And uh, so, uh, since we're going to take them on, that means we're going to have to increase our, our faith, what? Promise giving. Amen. All right, preacher, I'm going to add some more to mine. You just keep adding to yours, and he'll, ke and he'll keep adding to you. Doesn't it work out that way? Yeah, okay. Ain't that a blessing? So just let us know, okay? And we'll, we'll uh, take care of those plane tickets. Amen. Uh, amen. How about that? Uh, anybody want anybody wants to say something? Give, yes, sir. I'm just going to vote what God tells me to vote, and that's it. And uh, all right, I like that, Kathy. Anybody else want to say a thing before we go? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> a really good family. Save me and give me a really, really good family. Ain't that a blessing? Amen. That's good. Anybody else before we go? Because if he's told you to testify, you better do it. You better do it. Is that it? All right. Well, uh, don't leave before you get your offer now, okay? Don't leave. Don't, no missionary leaves before that. Okay? The treasure is here, too. Okay? We'll get a check from the treasure and give you a, give you a love on before you leave. And uh, we'll try to make sure it's more than 20 bucks. Okay? Now you think I'm kidding you. There was a missionary one time. This is, this is 40 years ago or more. He told the story. He went down. To, and I, of course, he didn't. I just drug it out of him. I said, tell me what happened. He said, you don't want to hear this story. I said, I want to hear it. Went all the way from North Carolina, all the way down to Georgia, left on a Saturday. Preacher said, come on down. It'd be better if you got there on Saturday. Cause he, and so the preacher came on down. The missionary came on down. Missionary and three or four children.
came all the way from the mountains of North Carolina all the way down to central Georgia. Got a motel, called the preacher. Said, we're here. And the preacher said, that's good. We'll see you in the morning. Hung up. Didn't say, where you stand, what you need. Just, we'll see you in the morning. So he had to get a motel room, which took most of his money. Got next morning, had a little bit of money left. And uh, got a little something to eat. Went to church. Preacher's there. and Said, we're glad to have you. Said, I want you to, I want you to, I want you to speak in Sunday school this morning. So he spoke in Sunday school. The adult class took a little offering. And when Sunday school was over, they went to church service, and that was it. Didn't say it's good to have missionary so-and-so here. And when church was over, everybody left, and he was out in the parking lot with his wife and three kids by himself. And they, and they were coming here that night. And so when they got here, they called me, and I said, well, we got you a motel room, you wanna, and we want to feed you. Because we didn't have what we have now, we just gave him a motel room. He said, "You gonna put us in the motel room?" I said, "Yes, sir." And uh, you want to eat, eat before church or after church? He said, "Well, we're about to eat after church because we can't get time to eat now." So after church, we took him out to eat in a nice restaurant. And what makes it so good is, I said, "Get anything you want. We've got. We're gonna buy you a good meal." And the kids, all the kids, got hot dogs. <laughs> and what what made it? What, what brought the story? To, I like was because he said he said this ain't what we got this morning and uh, so we want to be good all the preachers we, we know that okay but anyway that doesn't that's a rare story that's most missionaries are well taken care of he'll testify that they have view, very few horror stories but there are out there and so uh, we want to be a good story not a horror story alright so we're going to dismiss in a word of prayer you want to step on back there preacher uh, what 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 Oh, B, I didn't see your hand, B. Yeah, well, I am so sorry. Okay, go ahead. Nate, that's something. My wife said it's probably the best thing in the whole service this morning. I mean, as far as, you know, just what, <laughs> I don't, well, as far as this, the spirit, uh, forget it. In other words, to do that was exceptional is what she was saying. Amen? Am I making sense? I do sometimes. Preacher, get on back there and let folks speak to you. Amen. Don't leave. We'll, we'll get you that love offering, Jay. Well, it's been good, hasn't it? I tell you what, every church needs to hear that message tonight. Could I say every church? And if any, any church needed it, we needed it. All right. So hope you'll have a great night. And uh, tomorrow, we're going, uh, this week, we're going to mail out our letters to the uh, churches and people from camp meeting, give them the details. We normally get it out in January. Here it is, the middle of February. And. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get this thing rolling. And how are we going to do it? By what? Amen. By faith. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for what you've sent our way. We pray, God, that you'll bless this couple as they continue their journey, Lord, as they head to Indonesia, the place, God, you uh, want to plant them. And, God, I pray that they'll bloom there for the glory of God. Lord, help us to be a part of what they'll do in the years and months and days to come. In thy name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen.